Hi everybody. So what we're going to do in this video is talk about multi-level models. I'm going to do this a little on the fly, so we'll see how this goes. Um, but a couple weeks ago I did a multi-level model lecture in person, which I recorded and put on YouTube. But I don't think we really had good time to cover exactly how you interpret multi-level coefficients and understanding the models that you're getting. So this video is really set to give you another example and to talk about what are these numbers that I'm getting even mean. Um, so I'm going to set my working directory here to where I have this file saved. Um, and then import the data file I'm working with. Um, <clears throat> So let me just save this too. No, example.bar. So um, the data file is called MLM example, and this will be on my website, uh, statstools.com. Um, did I spell that wrong? CSV MLM example. Oh, I can't spell. <clears throat> okay, so what is in this data set, just first of all? Um, and so it is a data set with gender, with the name of a particular college, computer anxiety, technical experience, and uh, computer experience. So what we're going to do is predict computer anxiety with a continuous variable, technical experience and computer experience, and a categorical variable, gender or college. Um, and I'm going to show you all of these at once. I probably wouldn't do it this way, but just kind of give you an example of um, different ways I can analyze this data. Um, now, I could treat technical experience and computer experience as repeated measures data and analyze those as like sort of um, in repeated measures ANOVA style, which is what MLM is really popular for. Or I could use them as more control variables and do this as ANCOVA. Um, and so the flexibility of MLM is I could do it either way, I just would change the way the data set functioned. Um, since I probably wouldn't consider those the same measure uh, and they're in very different scales, I'm going to treat technical and computer experience as control variables and then look at um, either gender or college. So the first problem I have with this data set is that my, my um, two categorical variables are not factored. Um, and I really want to do that first, because uh, otherwise, when I start to run these analyses, it will treat them as continuous variables that are one and two, um, and imply a linear trend, which I don't want to do with this. So to do that, what I can do um, <clears throat> is basically say example gender, and I can factor it. Okay, so we use a factor command. So the next piece in the factor command is what are the what are the levels that are currently there? And so that's one and two. And then what are the labels I want to give one and two? And I think it's let's just go male and female. So now if I look at a table of that variable, you'll see that I have labels. Okay. It was probably the other way, but eh, okay, we'll go with it. So now let's do the college column, same function, so factor, college, the levels in this one are 1, 2, and 3, Oops. there we go, I was going to be very unhappy, and so we've got arts, so your traditional liberal arts, sciences, those hard science people, chemistry and biology, and math. And now if I did a table of that function, or that data, just to make sure I didn't wipe anybody out, I still have numbers. All right, so now that my data is set up correctly, um, I could go through an entire set of data screening. So I would screen this data set in wide format if you can, um, which involves doing uh, checking for normality and linearity, you still have those issues. Homoscedasticity, you don't have to worry about quite so much because, um, if your data is not uh, homoscedastic, you can test for random intercepts and random slopes. That might be the reason why it's not homoscedastic. Um, 
missing data is not a huge deal. You should still look at it, but it's not a huge deal in multi-level models. Um, I still would want to check for multicollinearity. Um, so what we want to start with is data screening. And I'm going to treat this data set as nothing special because MLM, while special, while I like what most people think of as kind of a scary analysis, is really just repeated measures on speed. So um, we would treat it like that to analyze it. Um, so it's starting with data screening. You want to check for accuracy first. Um, and so I'm just going to take a summary of my example data. My gender and college columns are factored appropriately. That's where I would probably have fixed those as an, in an accuracy issue. I would want to make sure that my minimum and maximum values are correct. Um, so they are in very different scales, which may or may not cause me problems later. But computer anxiety is a uh, 1 to 7. Um, tech experience, I think, is like negative 3. Computers frighten me. I don't want to touch them to um, positive 3. I use computers all day, and I'm really happy with it. Oh, I'm sorry, that's technical. Uh, computers is a weird scale that runs from like 0 to 1,000 about your how much you're using your computer. Tech experience also includes like programming, taking things apart, putting them back together again, so you can think of it as more um, hands-on in the, in the computer kinds of experience. <clears throat> so my data looks accurate, and then I don't need to change any of these values. If you end up needing to change them, I have a whole video on uh, how to fix accuracy issues on YouTube. I would then also check for missing data and that you do in the same way. So I'm just going to do it twice but there are no NAs down here. So this is really great. I don't have to fix anything. Um, if you're interested in understanding uh, how to mice, how to replace missing data, if you want to. In an MLM you don't necessarily have to. Um, I also have a separate video for that that talks about how to use the mice function, multiple imputation, comp you chained equations, um, which is a really great package. Uh, you do have to have more than one column for it to work, and um, all of your your data, it will automatically pick what type of data to fill in. So that's why I like it. There's not a whole lot of thought. Um, but if you wanted to go crazy, you could. Now, outliers. Since this is a regression style analysis, I really want to analyze all of the data for outliers, but especially these three repeated components. I can't really change the fact that they're in a particular gender or a particular college. Um, and I could use those in combination to, to study outliers, but um, Mahal Nobis doesn't particularly like categorical variables because it wants to create an average. So I'm going to leave that out and just scan these three. So you put a z-score each column and look at their scores and see if they're within 3 to 3. Or you could use Mahal Nobis distance as a measure across all three columns to look at how crazy their data is. Um, across the entire data set and not just one. So do we have someone who's very computer anxious but also has lots of experience? That would be an odd combination, likely. Um, or they say they have no tech experience but all the computer experience. So we can look for people whose scores maybe don't seem quite right. So I want to save that. And we're going to calculate that using the Mahalanobis function. Uh, and the way you do that is you put in the data set name but I need to drop those first two columns. If you aren't sure what that's doing, you can highlight it and run it. Okay. So all that's done is drop the, temporarily drop the first two columns. It didn't delete them. See, over here they're still there, um, but it drops them. Okay, so uh, the space before is give me all rows, so I don't want to drop any people. And then this is columns, so I did negative C12. The C function just combines things together. Uh, and that will drop columns one and two for me. Okay, so it's data set name, and then you can use call means, and I'm going to type the exact same data set name again. Oops. And I copied it. Okay, so that's where I'm calculating the average score, the centroid from, and then I'm going to do covariance of that same data set. Now, if you have NAs in your data that you aren't deleting because this is MLM, you want to add uh, NA.RM equals true for call means, but unfortunately the one for covariance is not the same. It's use equals pairwise dot complete dot ops. Okay. Let's 
So what we've done is we've created the Mahalanovis column um, that tells us the overall distance from a centroid, which is for our continuous variables. So I could do a summary of those to look at them. But it doesn't mean a whole lot unless I know what kind of cutoff score I need to do. So what would be a bad um, outlier in this case? So we can calculate what the cutoff score would be by using the q chi-square function. Okay. And so it's going to be 1 minus alpha, which we're using 0 0.001 because this is data screening, or you can just type 0.999. And then we want to do in call, so the number of columns, and I want to use the same thing that I used to calculate Mahalanobis. Okay. And that just makes it more flexible um, because I don't have to sit there and go, okay, one, two, three. I can just run this piece of code to know what the degrees of freedom are. And they're going to be too many parentheses. Oh, I forgot a square bracket. There. There we go. There we go. So it's going to be three degrees of freedom. So cutoff score for three degrees of freedom and um, 0 0.001 as the criteria is 1627. So if I have, do I have any people who are above that score? I don't think so. But if you aren't sure, you can do this. Okay. And anything that is false. So uh, this is taking a summary of how many people are less than the cutoff score. And they're all less than the cutoff score. Um, if I wanted to exclude them, what I could do is do my example data um, where I, keep, I check... Um, Keep all row, wait, wait, no, Mahal, sorry, less than cutoff. So look by row, keep all columns. Okay. And so it shows me that I would keep everybody, so I could just reset the data set. Right. And I didn't drop anyone at this point. Now normally I would tell you to save these data sets as different things as you go. Um, so at this point it would be no outliers. Uh, but this is just an example. Uh, so I'm not following my own rules at this moment, but it'll be okay. After we check for outliers, we definitely have to check for multicollinearity, and that is be for sure with a multi-level design. Um, we need to check for uh, multicollinearity because um, brain fart. <laughs> Sorry, because otherwise when we're doing regression, this will freak out. Whew, had a moment there. So I want to use the coral core function. So I'm going to tell it to use the example data, but I'm going to need to drop um, the gender and college column because it does not like to um, correlate factor variables. Okay. And so I would just look on computer anxiety and tech experience are um, correlated, but not at a problematic level, which would be 0.9. So we're okay. Um, you can also use the symbols for numbers function, simnum, um, on a saved correlation table. And it will show you symbols, and so you could look for a star or a B. Those would be your problematic ones. Okay. So all that looks good. Um, now, we could run this as a real regression to test the assumptions, but... The problem with that is that I'm not entirely sure LME will give us these um, values and I just have it in my head to run it this way. So we're going to run a quick fake regression to check our assumptions, but I probably could incorporate them into the LME analysis too, the multi-level part. But let's just go ahead and do those without running LME so I don't have to melt anything right now. I can check this in wide format. Um, so let's start by running the assumption setup. So I'm going to set up a fake variable. Oops, sorry, it's r chi square. Okay. And I want n, so the number of rows in my example data set. And 7 degrees of freedom because that tends to work pretty well. Oh, I don't want to call this fake. I want to call this random. Sorry, got ahead of myself. So then I want to make a fake regression, a regular linear regression, where I predict that random variable, which should give me random errors um, and I can make sure that my errors are identically distributed but randomly. I'm going to say dot give me the whole data set because I'm going to use this entire data set for uh, my analysis and then I do data equals example. I want to set up my uh, fitted values. So you do 
fake fitted dot values. And then lastly, I want to standardize those. So not lastly, sorry. Let's scale those so that would get put them in a z-score. That'll make it easier to interpret the graph here in a minute. Also want to get my standardized residuals, and that is the R student function. All right, so let's do linearity first. It's the easiest. So it's a QQ norm plot of the standardized residuals. That will give me a nice normal QQ plot. And if you aren't sure what to do, do a b line zero comma one. And you want most of the dots to be close to the line. So this is a pretty good linearity plot. They're all pretty close. So that would make a linear multi-level model um, appropriate. We could also try this as nonlinear. It may be slightly cubic, but um, I think probably linear is going to be the best fit for this model, mostly because it's made of data. We can check our normality. So that would be a histogram of the standardized residuals. And we want that to be centered over zero and approximately the same between two and two or three and three. Looks pretty good. Centered over zero. Most of the data is between two and two. You can also check skew and kurtosis by using the moments library. But since my multivariate histogram looked okay, I'm going to stick with that. Um, we can check for um, homogeneity. We don't really need to check for homoscedasticity, but um, I can, right? Uh, so let's do a plot, plot with a P, of uh, the fitted values with the standardized residuals. We're going to do A, B, ooh, we got somebody crazy, uh, 0, comma, 0, and then A, B line, B, comma, 0, or B equals 0. That'll just give me some nice quadrants to look at. Okay, if I ignore this one person out here, most of the data is even between 2 and 2. It does seem to be biased more towards this direction. Oh, yay, El Capitan. If you shake your mouse, it gets really big. <laughs> um, so sorry about that. Um, this way, between 2 and 2, it looks okay. And homogeneity, it's actually looking pretty even. I mean, we have this one little dot out here that I don't know what's going on, but uh, generally this is even. Now, do realize if you do it this way, this is a random analysis. So if I were to run this again, I would get a different picture. And so if your picture looks kind of funny, run it again, see what happens. And so what happened was that we sort of switched where the quadrants were, but it's the same, it's going to be the same spread of the data. It's just that sometimes we, based on the random variable that we're using, we'll get them in slightly different places. Now, it shouldn't drastically change. Because look, we still have negative 1 to 3, which we did a minute ago. Uh, but most of the data is still between 2 and 2, both directions. So I'd say it's probably okay. Now that does not mean that I won't have a random slope problem where some people go up and some people go down. Um, so I should still check for that. But I don't seem to have a, a V-shaped pattern or a triangle-shaped pattern that really would indicate uh, a moderation analysis, so interactions um, and problems with homoscedasticity. All right, so let's get into running the actual MLM. And I haven't done just a whole lot of these in R, so I have a little cheat sheet right here. The first thing you want to test um, is an intercept-only model. So what we're going to do is come down here and run some of these models. So I'm just going to copy them over. Um, and so what happens is the first model is an intercept-only. So we're going to use the generalized least squares function that is part of base R, so I do not need to load anything. And we're going to use maximum likelihood estimation. So we're switching from a least squares type of analysis to maximum likelihood. So generalized least squares is another type of least squares. Max likelihood is an iterative analysis that picks the most likely value, hence the name. Okay. And so what I want to do first is i got to set up the analysis. So to make this an MLM analysis, if I'm looking at my example data here, this is really regular regression because I don't have anything special that makes it MLM. So what I'm going to do, um, and I might not make this clear at the beginning, is I'm going to take um, tech experience and um, comp experience and stack them so that I can get one overall sort of experience variable. 
So to do that, oops, is I'm going to melt the data, reshape. Okay. That's our example long, so this will be long data format. And what I want to do is melt. Um, another problem I have that, so before I get to the melt, is I don't have a participant number. So I need a participant number. Okay. You have to have one for this type of analysis. So what I'm going to do is do example partner um, equals one, two, in row. Okay, so what that's going to do is it's going to add a variable called participant number. And it's going to uh, make that variable one through the number of rows. So all that did out here was just add me a participant number. Okay. You could have one made up in your data set, or you can just add one manually like that. Now I can melt. So you melt the data. You, uh, you For the ID function, it's all the variables you want to keep. So I want participant number, gender, college. And measured is the things you want to melt. Oops, sorry. Hold on. We also want to leave in comp. So computer anxiety. So measured is the ones we want to combine into one column. That should be everything. So if you aren't sure, if you have a data set with a huge amount of columns, you have a names function, then you can cut and paste them. So gender, college, computer anxiety, participant number, and then melt these two. Now, what I have is this very useless name of a column called variable and value. Now what variable is, is it's the level for um, the type of um, experience we're talking about. I'm actually going to totally ignore that. Now it is stacked, so I should control for it, but I'm going to control for that by using participant number. So each participant has one of those things. Um, and so I'm going to uh, control for random intercepts by participant. And that will also control for um, variable because they're perfectly correlated because each person has one of these things. Um, and then I'm going to use value out here to be my dependent variable. I, this is going to run a little goofy because these are not on the same scale at all, but this is just an example. Okay, so this might might be kind of messy. We'll see. <clears throat> Alright. So, for an intercept-only model, I'm predicting the value. That's going to be my dv. I won't change the name of it here, but um, if you change, uh, I'm sorry, if you um, are doing this data for real analysis, you might consider changing that to be more mnemonic, meaning it means something other than value, because value may not make sense later. Okay. So value is approximately one, which means that I'm estimating the intercept only, and then data equals experiment long, example long, in this, in this particular example. Method equals ML, NA action equals NA omit, which will leave out any missing values that you have. Could not find function GLS. Well, I thought that was in base R. Let's see where it's actually hiding. Oh, okay. So it's in N L N E L M E. Good gracious, can't talk right now. So before we get to models, we also have to load N L M E function uh, library. I thought it was in base R. I was wrong. Um. So what is what is this model going to tell me? Well, it's going to give me an intercept. Um, and so I think what I'm going to do real quick, and this is just for this example, is um, standardize my two columns because they are in wildly different scales. And this is something you can consider. It's called centering, where you take uh, columns that might be multicollinear and, and uh, subtract the mean from them. In my particular case, the problem I have is if I'm using these two uh, as measures of the same thing, as you will notice, they are very, very different scales. So if I center them, that will at least put them on the same scale. Okay. 
This is not something you'd necessarily have to do for your data, but because I picked probably not the best example, we'll have to make this work a little better. There we go. So now when I look at my long data set, um, they're more on the same scale. It does make interpretation a little difficult, but it will make this analysis run a little better. All right, there we go. So <clears throat> what we want to say see is if we are able to um, create these models. So uh, since we centered them, the value of the intercept is likely to be zero because when you center things, it makes the, the mean zero, um, which isn't a bad place to start, but it will make this p-value non-significant. But that doesn't really mean a whole lot. So at the moment, my intercept is zero, which isn't too surprising because I'm predicting the, the mean of the column. And I just forced this column's mean to be zero. Okay. Uh, it tells me the uh, standard error around that. So here's my zero. See, this is in scientific notation, so uh, that's basically zero. The standard error is about 0.08 points up and down around that. Um, and then it gives me TMP, but I'm not too concerned that that's significant right now. Shows me my standardized residuals, so I could do my um, data screening on this analysis. But right now, I'm just running this model as a comparison for the next model. Okay. So we're going to switch to LME, so uh, linear mixed effects, and we're going to use the exact same code. So values approximately one, data equals long data. <clears throat> uh, estimation method is ML omit any missing data and then now we're going to add a random intercept okay so just like this indicates intercept this also means intercept based on participant number here so we're going to create a uh, allow them to start in different places because people will have different um, levels of experience so this will allow those experiences to vary Oh, it's not called long data, it's called example long. It's a bad thing about copying code. All right, so does that make a difference when I allow those intercepts to vary? I don't think it's going to because I centered everything. Um, and so let's see here. Da, da, da. So my intercept is still very close to zero. My standard error is approximately the same. And my T value is basically zero still, but if you aren't sure, you can use the ANOVA function. Model one, model two. Okay. And the difference between a model that controls for participant and a model that does not control for participants is effectively nothing. Okay. So setting this up by participant doesn't make a difference. Um, the choice of scaling factor though might. So we're using the scale function. Now, this. there we go. <clears throat> so it's in base R. So if we turn off maybe scale equals true, this is one thing I didn't get to talk about in the lecture was the use of centering. Some people argue that you shouldn't. Some people argue that you should. Okay. So now what I've done is I just subtracted the mean from everything. So I didn't standardize it. So I have made the average zero, but I haven't standardized the um, uh, standard deviation. Okay. So that's gonna change my estimate of the intercept. Okay. And this one as well, but it probably won't change the difference. So with different versions of centering, um, what is going to happen is you're going to get different estimates for um, like the intercept or the slopes, uh, but you may not get differences between the two models because you're still doing the same mathematical tr um, transpose of column. Okay. So that's a little bit on centering that I didn't get to cover in that lecture as well. I would argue if you don't have to center, don't. Okay. If you need to center, do. So let's see what would happen if we didn't center this data set. So I'm going to go back to my original data, add my participant number. Okay, I'm not going to center the data. 
Although I really should because these are which is wildly different scales. One's like a 300 point scale, one's like a 3 to 3 scale. But if we don't run um, that particular thing. So the intercept now is still the average of the scores, which is now 164. Okay. Still 164 here. And so my ANOVA, I get approximately the same value. Okay, so even though I can try different versions of centering, you often get the same differences between models, but not the same model numbers. And the problem with <coughs> interpreting centered um, estimates is that you have to remember that they're centered or z-scored. Um, so let's pretend So I'm going to have to pretend here for the rest of this because um, this is an example. Um, in theory, if this model 1 versus model 2 is not significant, you don't need to nest. You can just run along happily and do whatever regression you're trying to do or ANOVA or whatever. But in practice, people aren't down with that so much. They have they basically said if it is this stack structure, you need to run it as stacked. Um, and I think if you knew from the outset that you were going to test people in a repeated way and you were trying to combine all those repeated columns into one overall score, other than using like a scale, um, it's probably best if you go ahead and nest it and just say, well, we controlled for correlated errors and the independence assumption. It doesn't matter if it's significant. I'm controlling for that assumption um, whether or not it is. But there are people disagree on this point. All right, so now what we're gonna do, I don't need my notes anymore, is pretending the model two is the best. Let's add predictors. So now I'm going to use my gender variable um, and college, well, yeah. And we'll just do all three at once. Um, computer anxiety to predict our value, and we'll leave everything else the same. Now, if you wanted to run this in a hierarchical regression style, you could add one predictor at a time and compare each model individually. So I could do gender, um, see what happens, add college, see what happens, add computer anxiety, see what happens. Um, but in this particular case, I'm going to do a simultaneous regression where I just throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. Okay. And that's a difference in hypothesis question. So if I want to first control for computer anxiety and then test gender in college, which I kind of mentioned earlier, I would break that into steps. If I don't care and just want to do everything at once, I would do it like this. Okay. But this is how you add your predictors. That's the important part I'm getting at here. Um, and you're changing the one here. But you don't change the random thing down here, especially if it was significant in this step. It didn't throw up on me, so that's good. Let me take a minute to talk about what do, um, what do all these things mean. So it gave me an intercept of 150, which is the average score for participants on our um, combined tech experience variable. I'm remembering that this is not very well coded. Okay, it gives me a standard error. So that's the um, range around the scores. Um, and that is significantly different than zero, not that I care that much. Now what does this random effects thing tell me? It tells me the standard deviation of that intercept. So yes, this is the standard error because I'm calculating t. This tells me how much we're allowing people's intercepts to vary around that score. So on average, um, people's scores at, are 0.01 up and 0.01 down. And when I did this lecture in class talking about body checking, what we were finding was on average people were checking about 0.4 to 0.6 but that varied quite considerably around that score. So larger numbers here will create a significant difference between model one and model two because the larger the standard deviation for the intercept, the more there is a range of people's different average starting scores. 
In this particular experiment, there isn't a huge range, which is why that intercept, um, mo uh, random intercept model is not significant. Okay. All right, so, um, well, this is like a terrible example, but we'll just <laughs> keep pretending. So gender is not a significant predictor of our overall variable. Uh, college is not a significant predictor. And somehow, ah, crap. When I reset my variable, I forgot to do this. Okay. Forgot to factor them, so that is problematic. There we go. There we go. Okay. So um, you'll notice how factoring them made a big difference here, but the intercept randomness um, isn't changing that much. I want to go back and just make sure my model one and two aren't different. All right, it shouldn't be because those did not include those variables. Um, but let's see, right? So I still get the same difference between models, but treating these as factors does change the degrees of freedom. So that changed what was going on here a little bit. So the average score is actually 172. We've got a slightly smaller standard error because our variables are accounting for more of the error but it's not really varying that much around that, bar that score. Okay. All right, so gender is not significant here. And you'll notice how it stuck the word female next to it. Now remember that R, unless you force it to, um, puts your levels in alphabetical order. So if I did a summary again of that data, Remember that it's going to put these in alphabetical order when, when treating them as ordered levels. So what's happening is it's giving our difference between male and female here. So anytime you have a categorical variable that has two levels, right, it is that indicator here will tell you um, which one, actually we force these to be male and female, so they're not in alphabetical order. If you import it from a text file with the labels already in it, it'll be in alphabetical order. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> so what this indicator is right here is it's telling you what the what the group is for the comparison. Okay. So what happens is in dummy coding, um, you have a control group, so the overall comparison group, and then you have the group it's being compared to. So just like a pairwise t-test, it's going to have some group that compares everybody else to. So it's like taking yourself and comparing it to all these other people. Okay. And so what's happening here is the first group, which is male, um, which I can see that here, is getting compared to female. So this here is telling you who it's getting, the, the control group is getting compared to. Now I don't mean control group like they don't get the IV, I mean like comparison group. Okay. So what this value here tells me is the difference in the DV between those two groups. So if I were to run um, uh, the means for these two groups, I would find that males, uh, okay, so it's male minus female. Males have the higher score, right? Because if I'm going to do M minus F, you have to have the higher score for it to be positive. So my males are scoring higher than females. Um, and I could probably while this isn't a perfect estimate, I could do the mean for this data set. Oop, nope, nope, oop. Not what I meant to do, sorry. Okay, so t apply allows me to calculate the mean based on a um, categorical IV. What I see is males have a higher score than females. Oh, females have the higher score. So it must be doing female minus male. Okay, to get a positive number here, it's going to be doing female minus male. Okay. Um, and so that's why running the means is always a helpful thing, so you can see what it actually looks like, because I had that backwards. All right, so it's going to do uh, this group minus the other group. Okay, so this tells you the difference in the means. Okay. And that difference is not statistically significant. Um, the next thing that happens is I took my three categorical levels and broke it into two dummy coding uh, variables. So it does not do every pairwise combination because that would be multicollinear. It does what's called contrast coding. And so it breaks it down into 
everything versus the lowest coded groups. So it's coding, comparing everything to arts. And so let's look at those means so I don't guess the wrong thing this time. Okay, nope, I still want to do value here, but let's do college. So it's comparing everybody to arts. So arts has 163, sciences 157, math 172. So sciences versus art, the sciences are lower. Okay. Um, college, um, arts versus math, the um, arts are lower. So math has the higher score. Okay. Which means that when I compare technical experience, um, and I'm using, um, actually I think it did this backwards, but anyway, we'll just go with it. If I'm using, um, if I'm comparing their different technical experiences, uh, the math group has the highest technical experience, the arts has the next highest, and science has the least. Okay. Um, and then so, but I've only compared arts to sciences and arts to math. If I want to compare sciences to math, I have to reorder the levels and run this whole thing again. Okay. So to get all pairwise combinations, you do have to reorder the variables. Now if I look at computer anxiety predicting this tech experience, so I would expect people that are highly anxious to avoid technical experience, I do get a negative number here. So that means as computer anxiety goes up, technical experience goes down. Okay. So I really wanted to focus on, even though they're not significant, talking about how do I interpret these, um, these B values for categorical predictors. Okay, so when there's only one group, it's compared to the other group. When there's multiple groups, more than two columns, it's comparing everybody to one of them. Um, and so it's comparing everything to arts, um, because they're my first group coded here. And then how to run the means here. So T apply is DV comma IV comma function. So give me the mean. Just so I can see which group it is, so I don't have to remember does negative mean this one's higher, does negative mean this one's lower, because clearly I got that backwards. Um, and then if you're looking at a categorical predictor, this score here indicates the uh, slope coefficient. So as computer anxiety goes up, um, technical experience is going down. Okay. The other thing it does is give you the correlations. Excuse me. Um, between different conditions. Uh, you don't want those to be too high or you're running into multicollinearity problem. It gives you standardized residuals and then just shows you the number of people slash columns, I'm sorry, slash rows, considering this is an MLM. Okay. Um, and so that's a not so cute example of a multi-level model when really I wanted to focus on like how do I data screen this, how do I um, how do I interpret categorical versus continuous predictors, which anyone who's teaching you like a regression style analysis should also talk about. Um, but how do I do that in MLM? What does a random intercept mean? Okay. Uh, the other thing I can try is a random slope model. So maybe my problem isn't the intercept. Maybe it's a random slope. Okay, so random slopes allow people to have different slopes. So I'm going to pick the same model I just did. I doubt this will work, but it's worth showing you how it work, how it maths. Okay. Data equals example wrong. Okay. So it's the same. Um, um, equation. Uh, and then the data is the same and then all this stuff is the same. So now what I'm doing is I'm changing the participant number to include a random slope. So maybe I think that computer anxiety is a random slope. Now I could do any of these variables, but I'm just going to pick my categorical, or my continuous one. Sorry. Um, so maybe it's some people are really anxious about computers, but they know in their field they really have to learn how to use them. So they're trying to ease their anxiety by using them more and getting more experience. Okay. Um, and so that would mean that half of them will go up and half of them will go down, which would be bad for us. The other thing I've done here is asked it to iterate more. Um, and that's not always needed. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. I just wanted to show you what it looks like if you want more iterations. Okay, it did not crash, so yay.
So let me look at this. <clears throat> now, what I should see is probably roughly the same um, thing I had before, but now I have a, um, a standard deviation for my random slope, which is pretty small. Okay, if the standard deviation is small, and that indicates it probably isn't worth your trouble doing um, because that means the slopes are not differing that much. Uh, but if I wasn't sure if this model was any different, I could just compare them. Now I'm comparing only model three to model four because <coughs> three and four, the only way they differ is by um, the random slope. Now if I compare two to three, that would tell me if my um, adding all the predictors is better than nothing, okay, which is unlikely since they were all uh, non-significant. And adding that random slope didn't do anything for me. My log likelihoods are not the same or not different at all. Um, and so there's no benefit to the random slope. But if there was a benefit to the random slope, you would see this would be larger than zero. Okay. Um, model three and model four would be different and this um, number here would change. Okay. If you find that random slopes are significant, uh, I tell you to graph the data and look at what variables might be interacting with your random slopes to see if you can do a moderation style analysis, so interactions and regression, to um, predict those random slopes. Um, so for example, with the body image data, that I'm working with some students on, it might be that their overall level of body dissatisfaction would predict why some people's slopes go up and some people's slopes go down. Or maybe it's um, a negative affect that for some people it goes up and go down, goes down. So uh, using another variable to help understand those random slopes rather than just writing them off as, well, some people are weird, um, which happens a lot because participants are unpredictable sometimes. Um, but I just want to show you how to run a random slope. So slope would be on this side, um, controlled by this variable on this side. Okay. All of this is using the in LME library and not LME4. Um, they do approximately the same thing, but in LME seems to work better. Um, the reshape library we used for melting the data. If you wanted to create a plot, you could do that through ggplot2. So all of that is a uh, example of an MLM, albeit not significant, but how do I run these? How do I do random intercepts, random slopes? How do I interpret the predictors for them?